Clinton era and also the spending cuts that were put in place uh, during negotiations with Republicans back then and the Clinton administration. Could you agree to some sort of a, a deal where that includes increases in tax revenue for spending cuts? Well, the vote uh, last night, obviously, on suspension was overwhelming. It would have taken a two-thirds majority to pass a clean uh, increase in the debt ceiling. Obviously, the two-thirds majority was against even even more than a two-thirds majority. Now, some of the Democrats that voted ag against probably uh, are of the mindset, well, we don't want it to just be a clean increase in the debt ceiling. We want it to be tied to increasing uh, of taxation. On the Republican side, uh, obviously, most members, if not all members, uh, do not want tax increases. We feel that we need to cut government spending, wasteful government spending, and we feel like, as in, in the Paul Ryan Republican path to prosperity budget, it clearly states that we want to simplify and lower tax rates, not only for individuals, but especially for corporations, because then you have a broader base of people and businesses paying taxes, paying their fair share, and stimulating the economy. You have more job growth, uh, and then people, albeit at a lower tax level, paying taxes, and in, in, in the end, you end up with more revenue and not less revenue. Let's go to phone calls. Danny is a Democrat in Gilberttown, Alabama. You're on the air with the Congressman. Yes, thank you for speech, man. Uh, sir, you have the lowest tax right now. That Danny? Yes. You're still there. We're listening. Go ahead. We have the lower tax, you were said. You, you were have saying? the lowest tax rates that you had in, 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 in 30 some years right now. And as far as raising the debt ceiling, you're not raising the debt ceiling for the spending now. You're raising it to pay for bills that you've already incurred. And if you do all of this cutting that you all want to do at the lower end, so you're going to hurt the economy more. Because that's what creates jobs is people having money at the lower end to buy things. That's supply and demand. All right. Let's get a response. Well, Danny, uh, you may well be right, and I think you are right in regard to the, the level of taxation today as it may have been uh, in past years. You mentioned, I think, the, the Clinton years. Uh, but the, the fact is, of course, as everybody knows, today we're in a global economy, and what we have to compare is not our tax rate today with our tax rate in the United States of 20, 30, 40 years ago, or maybe immediately after World War II when we were trying to pay for the, for the war, but we have to compare it to what uh, our competitors across the globe uh, tax their citizens, and if you look at those tax rates, the effective tax rate in this country, particularly at the corporate level, is so much higher than it is in most EU countries, and we have to uh, lower that tax rate to stay competitive globally. Can you lower the tax rate but get rid of the loopholes, the tax breaks that these corporations get? Would well, you agree to that? Yeah, uh, Greta, I would agree to that. And I think that's something that we, we are looking at very closely. I think there are provisions in, the, in our budget, in, in the House Republican budget, that do that. And I would be willing to sit down with the Democrats and look for other loopholes. Uh, I think it's very important to the American people that we be fair. That, that we don't uh, let, let one special interest group lobby so strongly that they get an advantage over the, 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 the common man, everybody else. So it is very important that we be fair and balanced and eliminate as many loopholes as we possibly can. Karen is a Republican in Norman, Oklahoma. Yes, I just want to thank them for trying to cut up there and save us taxpayers some money, but I get tired of always hearing about Medicare when we actually need to be talking about Medicaid and on the Section 8 and on the Social Security, why do kids get Social Security checks for asthma because their mom smoked while they were pregnant or because they have one arm longer than the other? All right, Karen, we'll take your issue with Medicaid. Go ahead, Congressman. Uh, well, Karen... Uh, the Medicaid program obviously uh, is not working very well. It's in fact about to break uh, all 50 states and believe me and you know uh, that many of those states are have democratic governors, democratic legislatures. Uh, in Georgia, my, my home state, it's, it's all Republican. Uh, it used to be all Democrat, but I mean we're all suffering from the same problem. Uh, states mostly have a balanced budget amendment. They can't spend more money than they take in in their, in their state taxation and the amount of money they get them from, from the federal government. Uh, so when that amount is cut or when the mandates for uh, additional 
coverage uh, such as was included in Obamacare, PAPACA, uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act of uh, 2010. Uh, it, the, the 15 million additional people that will be literally forced onto the, onto the Medicaid rolls in the various states are going to cost trillions of dollars on, on state budgets. So uh, in the Republican plan, the, the budget for 2012, a responsible budget, it suggests to block grant Medicaid to the states and give them the opportunity to be innovative, to be, to be the uh, uh, incubators uh, of new ideas and entrepreneurship uh, so that you get better health care to more people. This person tweets in wondering uh, about war and the cost of war, saying, why aren't you serious about paying for unpaid war? Well, uh, it's, it's a good tweet, uh, and I appreciate uh, the question. Uh, I, quite honestly, I think that w we, we should uh, pay for uh, the wars, and, and, and when we first went into Iraq uh, back in uh, 2003, uh, I felt very strongly that uh, some of that money that we were spending uh, to try to help bring democracy and, and rid that country of the dictator Saddam Hussein should be eventually uh, paid back to us when they increase their oil revenues. I still feel that way today. Uh, that's maybe part of the reason why I was uh, reluctant, uh, including the, the, the uh, ignoring by the president of the War Powers Resolution of 1974 to just simply go into Libya, yet a third front, uh, costing us more and more money uh, that we don't provide for except from borrowing more money. Uh, I thought that the, the president, and I still think the president, should uh, uh, abide by the War Powers Resolution as President Bush did in 2002 when he came to the Congress and got overwhelming support for action in Afghanistan and Iraq. Congressman Stanley Hoyer was on the floor yesterday talking about this debt ceiling vote, and here's what he had to say. I'll come back and get your reaction. This is a serious issue on which serious time has not been allotted because you put this on suspension. This is a serious issue. Our country is in crisis from a fiscal standpoint. Now, I wanted the gentleman to yield because I don't think the gentleman has any idea what the facts are. 89% increase in the debt under Ronald Reagan. He could have vetoed every one of those bills. Under George Bush, 115% increase in the debt. Under Bill Clinton, less than 40. Ladies and gentlemen, this issue is an important issue that is being treated not as an adult. This is not the adult moment of which Speaker Boehner spoke. And you didn't mention that the budget you voted for, I presume, I'm not sure, uh, increase the debt by $1.9 trillion between now and October 1st of this year. Congressman, did you agree to raise the debt under the George W. Bush administration? Well, I voted uh, at, at times to increase uh, the debt, and uh, I think I voted four times to increase the debt ceiling and six times not to increase the debt ceiling. Uh, I think it, it is wrong to have uh, the increase in the debt ceiling hidden in things like the stimulus bill or the TARP funding uh, to include that so that members can sort of hide their vote from their constituents, from the American people. Uh, I feel very strongly, and Steny Hoya is a very respected uh, member uh, and certainly uh, someone that I respect. Uh, he was making the point that the increase in the debt ceiling uh, that, that has occurred, I don't know how many times over the last six or eight years, maybe 11 different occasions, uh, as I point out to you, I voted against it more often than I voted for it. Uh, but we need to have an up or down vote on the, on the increase in the debt ceiling, not hide it from the American public. When you voted for it in the past, was it a clean vote? so to speak, and, and why was it okay then? It was a n not a clean vote. It has not been a clean vote since 1980 when the Gephardt rule was enacted such that the House would deem, if the Senate uh, votes for an increase in the debt ceiling, it would be deemed uh, voted uh, for passage by the House of Representatives. Now, in our Congress, in the 112th, we did change the rules in the House to eliminate the Gephardt ruling. 
But any Congress in the future could go back to that same old smoke and mirror games to fool the American people and raise the debt limit without having to face uh, their constituents. When you did vote yes, why was it okay then to vote yes and not now? It wasn't okay to vote yes then. Uh, it would not be okay to, uh, to vote yes now. We learn as we go, and certainly we know at this point that, that the amount of debt that we already uh, in, uh, have incurred, 14.294, trillion dollars worth of debt uh, is, is wrecking this economy. When you get to the point that 20 percent of your revenue on an annual basis goes to pay the interest on the debt, you have no money left over to defend the country from aggression. All right, we'll go to Don in La Cru Las Cruces, New Mexico, independent caller. Mr. Gingrich, I have a question. I have a quiz for you this morning. Okay, Don. Under George Bush, how many times did you raise the debt ceiling? Well, I don't know, Don. I would say probably uh, three times. Let me just take a, a, a guess at that, but I don't know the exact answer. We'll go to Bernice, Democratic caller, Detroit, Michigan. Hi, Greta. I'm, I'm probably a bit somewhat nervous because I'm a first-time caller, and my call is in regards to the debt ceiling. Sure. I, it, I don't care whether the congressmen explain it or not, but I want to piggyback a couple of other callers that raising the debt ceiling is just to pay for the for the credit card that we have already incurred. It's like going to the mall, taking your credit card, paying your bill, and then you get the bill in the mail, and you have to pay that bill. That's what the debt ceiling is, and it needs to be raised because of the increase in the amount of debt that was spent. And I would also like to say Medicare Advantage. President Obama did not take a dime from Medicare Advantage. What he did was took the insurance, it's like HMO, and the insurance companies was dispersing the Medicare Advantage, and he took the waste of the Medicare Advantage money from the insurance company, put it back into Medicare to extend Medicare for an additional 12 years. All right, Bernie. Congressman Gingry joined us on this morning's Washington Journal. The House is uh, right now voting on a procedural motion related to Homeland Security Department spending for the next budget year. The proposal itself is for 3% less than this budget year. The rule provides for an hour of general debate and unlimited germane amendments. We expect members to work through general debate and continue working on amendments tomorrow. Up next, we uh, are expecting a uh, debate on the rule for Homeland Security Department spending. This is live coverage of the House on C-SPAN. Vote. The ayes are 233. Mrs. Napolitano. Mrs. Napolitano votes no. 
Mr. Larson of Connecticut. Mr. Larson of Connecticut votes no. Ms. Bass of California. Ms. Bass of California votes no. Mr. Gosar. Mr. Gosar votes aye. On this vote, the ayes are 234, the noes are 183. The question of consideration is decided in the affirmative. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The House will be in order. The House will be in order. The gentleman from New York is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purposes of debate only. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection, and the gentleman will suspend. The House will be in order. The gentleman may resume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. House Resolution 287 provides for an open rule for consideration of H.R. 2017. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of House Resolution 278 to provide the rule for H.R. 2017, the Homeland Security Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2012. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be managing this rule, the first truly open rule since July 31, 2007, an Agricultural Appropriations Bill in the 110th Congress. The 112th Congress has made it clear that it supports an open process, and this rule exemplifies this initiative. For 119 members of the 112th Congress, this is their first experience with an open rule, including six members of the Rules Committee. I'm proud to be part of this body and this conference that is engaged in this transparency in government and this open process. Throughout the entire 111th Congress, only 810 amendments were considered. Only six months into this, the 112th Congress, 437 amendments have been considered. The leadership of this Congress is directly listening to the American people and their call for an open and transparent process. In addition, this bill also follows the promise that we have made to the American people and that it does not include any earmarks, either in the underlying bill or in the conference report. This commitment is what Americans desire and deserve, and this will continue the process in this Congress that we have committed ourselves to the American people to do. With that, I yield, I reserve the balance of my time. <clears throat> Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Colorado. Mr. Speaker, not only does this rule before the House drastically shortchange Homeland Security priorities, but this rule puts into force by deeming and passing the Republican budget resolution. This rule, uh, Section 9, uh, states very clearly that the Republican budget resolution shall have force and effect. That's the traditional language of a deem and pass. Yes, this budget deems passed the elimination of Medicare in order to keep in place tax cuts for the highest earners and tax breaks for oil. 
And while I do thank the majority uh, for offering up the first open rule uh, during my tenure in the House, I ask at what price? While I think there would be broad bipartisan support for an open rule, uh, I, for one, cannot support a rule that deems past the elimination of Medicare. Americans resoundedly oppose the approach of dismantling Medicare. They want us to put our economy on more secure fiscal footing and do it while strengthening our economy, creating jobs, and mending, not ending, Medicare. I would like to quote former Minority Leader John Boehner in reference to uh, the approach of uh, Demon Pass that was considered by the then Majority Democrats with regard to the health care bill. Then Minority Leader Boehner said, this legislative trick has been around for a long time, but it's never been used for a bill so controversial and so massive in scope, end quote. I would ask uh, my colleagues, what could be, I, I, will, I will not yield, what could be more massive than an elimination of Medicare contained in a rule rather than approach a simple vote on appropriations with regard to Medicare, cutting Medicare, bills with regard to Medicare reform? Uh, this is the most sweeping rule uh, that I've certainly ever faced on, in my time in the House of Representatives, and I think many of my colleagues agree. The passage of this rule alone would simply end Medicare uh, as we know it by construing in the demon pass of the bill itself, the operative language. And uh, let me explain how this works for some of our colleagues. Rules have broad authority. And I know that the, our, our chairman of the Rules Committee, Mr. Dreyer, uh, will on his own time be able to talk about this. The Rules Committee, by the good graces of the House, with, with our rules passing the House, has the ability to accomplish whatever the House allows us to through a rule. So in this rule, the House will deem under Section 9 that the Ryan budget, the budget that ends Medicare, the Republican budget, shall have force and effect until a conference report passes, and that will likely not occur unless the Republicans alter their uh, negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis the Senate and vis-a-vis -vis the President. Uh, I strongly urge a no vote on eliminating uh, Medicare uh, contained in Section 9 of this rule, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves, a gentleman from New York. Mr. Speaker, at this point in time, I'd like to yield to the Chairman of the Rules Committee as much time as he may consume. The gentleman from California is recognized for as much time as he may consume. Without objection. Speaker, let me uh, say at the outset that I'm particularly glad that you're in the chair because it was a speech that you delivered last September in which you said that we were going to, in fact, uh, if we won the majority, put into place an entire new structure that we had seen under neither political party over the preceding years. That is, the kind of openness, transparency, and accountability that the American people have said overwhelmingly that they want. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me just say to you personally how much I appreciate the stellar leadership that you provide, provided us on this very important issue. It is uh, extraordinarily ironic that we uh, last night saw the minority members of the Rules Committee actually vote no on the first open rule, the first open rule to be considered here in the House of Representatives. And yet over the past several months, they've been offering amendment after amendment in the Rules Committee calling for open rules. And so we report one out and they vote no. Now the other thing that I think uh, is very important for us to recognize is that um, we have important challenges that are ahead of us when it as it relates to Homeland Security. My colleague managing this rule, who by the way is one of the two floor managers, neither of whom has been able to see an open rule in the House of Representatives up to this moment, my friend didn't even mention the very important underlying legislation that is before us. The distinguished chair of the Committee on Appropriations, my friend Mr. Rogers is here. He and Mr. Adderholt Mr. Price and others on that subcommittee have worked very hard to deal with this priority item. Mr. Rogers uh, had served in the leadership on this subcommittee in the past and continues to have a great interest in it. And we should note that as we look at this new procedure that hasn't been considered since, as my friend from uh, Corning said, July 31st of 2007, what we have is a structure whereby members will have the opportunity to stand up and offer amendments. And uh, I listened to my friend from Providence, our new colleague, Mr. Cicilline, who said that he opposes this bill because of the fact that it makes a cut that he didn't like. Well, 
Mr. Speaker, as you know very well, under this rule, Mr. Cicilline or any other member of this House will be able to stand up, and if they can find offsets, if they can find offsets, they can have a vote on the amendment addressing their particular priority. I also have to say that in the Rules Committee, our good friend from North Carolina, Mr. Price, was before us talking about his concerns, and he asked for a waiver from the Rules Committee, nearly unprecedented, that would have uh, gone beyond the standard definition of an open rule and uh, provided him extraordinary protection for a priority which he thinks needs to be addressed. Well, Mr. Speaker, under this open amendment process, Mr. Price will again be able to offer an amendment that he will be able to, uh, if he can find an offset, have a vote on here in the House. And now I want to talk about this issue that my friend from Boulder addressed just a few moments ago and that we continue to hear over and over and over again. This so-called demon pass. This is not, Mr. Speaker, this is not a deem and pass provision. I will remind my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, we have already passed with a very rigorous debate here on the House floor, the budget. We've passed it already. Now, so that we are able to move ahead with the important appropriations work with the 302 allocations that need to be done, it is essential that we deem this budget because we have yet to have a conference report. We've yet to see our friends in the other body pass out a budget. And so it is essential that we deem, which has been done since virtually the beginning of time, to make sure that we can proceed with our very important work. Tough decisions need to be made. Under the leadership of Speaker Boehner, we are poised to make those tough decisions. Mr. Speaker, it's important that we have a strong bipartisan vote for the first of what will be more and more open rules in the 112th Congress. I urge my colleagues to support this. I look forward to sitting where Speaker Boehner is right now to preside over the first appropriation bill that will be considered under an open amendment process, and I look forward to a very rigorous debate. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Colorado. I uh, yield myself 30 seconds to respond, and uh, of course, while the underlying merits of the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill are critical, and if the rule passes, they'll be debated under the underlying rule, eliminating Medicare as we know it is even more uh, important to the American people, hence the discussion under this rule uh, as well. And I should point out that while this is an open rule, again, as a member of the minority, I'm deeply appreciative for the chance to amend the provisions of the Department of Homeland Security bill. If this rule passes, it will be too late to save Medicare under the bill. The very passage of this rule itself will deem passed the budget that contains the elimination of Medicare. And Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, the ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee, Mr. Levin. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for two minutes. Without objection. This is indeed an open rule in the sense it's so open that if you vote for the rule, you're voting to end Medicare. Republicans have done this once. If you vote for this, you're going to do it twice. And the gentleman who is handling this for the majority earlier talked about Medicare and said the Republicans are trying to save it. You don't save something by ending it, purely and simply. And to come to this floor and say you're saving it when you're ending it, that kind of talk is a big lie. We heard this with Social Security some years ago when the effort to privatize it was said to be an effort to save it. The public caught on and the public said no. The public has now said no to ending Medicare, but essentially you're tone deaf. Now you're doubling down on your plan to end it a plan that would force seniors to pay twice as much for their health care, a plan that increases seniors' drug costs, and a plan that puts insurance companies in, car in charge of senior health care. I'll finish. 
So instead of a bipartisan effort to save it, by this rule you are essentially deeming the budget that you passed that ended Medicare, period. So don't come and say you're saviors when you're eliminating a program. Stand up and be honest and say you want to replace it with something else. That something else is not Medicare. It's turning it over to the private insurance industry and saying to seniors who become eligible who would be, instead you're going to p double your costs. That's not forthright. If you vote again, if you vote yes on the rule, you are the second time voting to end Medicare. I yield back. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Uh, the chair would remind members that their remarks uh, should be addressed to the chair. Gentleman New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before I yield to the gentleman from New York, I would just like to make it clear that in our House Pass budget on page 58, line 8 and 9, it is clearly articulated there that current Medicare benefits are preserved for those in and near retirement without changes. I'd also note for the record, to clarify and make sure the record is very clear, that the budget that we are talking about is not going to be presented to the President and enacted into law. And what we are talking about here is nothing about ending Medicare as we know it. And at this point in time, I'd like to yield to my good friend, the Chairman, uh, Mr. King from New York, as much time or two, for two minutes. The gentleman from New York is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. At the outset, let me say I am proud to vote for this rule because it is an open rule, and I commend the Speaker for doing this. It's a really important step forward, I believe, in the history of this House. But let me say also that very reluctantly, in its current form, I will have to vote against final passage of this bill. I say this because we are at a stage now where the threat level, the Homeland Security threat level, is the highest it's been since September 11th. The killing of bin Laden has only made that worse. We know also from bin Laden's own records that he is aiming at maritime, he is aiming at uh, mass transit, and he's aiming at our major cities. Yet we are cutting each of those programs by 50 percent. 50 percent cut. Now, I can speak for New York in that I can tell you we have a 1,000 police officers, we have a Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, we have radiation detection, I can go through a whole list of programs. Every dollar in those programs can be accounted for. And I just cannot see why, at a time when the threat level is highest, as it's been since September 11th, that we are reducing Homeland Security grants by 50 percent. The department was set up in the aftermath of September 11th to fight terror, yet those grants are being reduced. And I know there's anecdotal evidence of this program isn't working, that isn't working. I would say specify what's not working, but don't take a meat axe. Don't cut across the board the way it's being done here. We're talking about human life. We're talking about uh, the, just a terrible threat to our cities, terrible threat to our ports, terrible threat to mass transit. And for those, and I understand the need to cut, I understand that need tremendously. Having said that, even from a strictly budgetary point of view, you have one dirty bomb go off in one subway in Boston, New York, or Chicago, and apart from the tragic loss of human life, apart from the tragic loss of human life, there will be incalculable economic devastation, which will also cause billions and billions of dollars of lost revenue and uh, jobs and have a terrible impact. I lived through September 11th. I know what it did to New York. I know the impact it had then. I don't want any other city, any other area in the country to go through that again, and yet we are reducing our defenses at a time when they're most needed. So with that, I would just ask all the members to give Chairman Rogers the credit, give Chairman Adderholt the credit, but unfortunately I have to vote against this. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, uh, while the majority is claiming this to be an open rule, the very passage of the rule itself deems past the Republican budget that ends Medicare. That will not be amendable in any way, shape, or form in the general debate. All that will be amendable are provisions relating to the Department of Homeland Security. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, the ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague. This is not an ordinary House rule we'll be voting on today. The resolution deems the provisions of the Republican budget to have, quote, full force and effect. In other words, a vote on the rule today is essentially another vote on the Republican budget plan 
that protects subsidies for the big oil companies while ending the Medicare guarantee and slashing investments in education. Those wrong-headed priorities were thoroughly rejected in the recent special election in New York. The American people clearly oppose a one-sided plan that would immediately reopen the prescription drug donut hole and tells seniors that in 10 years they will pay $9,000 more for their current set of benefits or take deep cuts in those benefits. Ladies and gentlemen, the median income of seniors on Medicare is less than $21,000 a year. What kind of budget says we're going to require seniors with median incomes of $21,000 a year to pay $9,000 more in just 10 years while cutting the rate for millionaires, the top marginal tax rate for millionaires, by 30 percent? What kind of budget would do it? Well, the budget that was passed by the Republicans a few months ago and the one they're doubling down on today. We have to have a balanced budget plan. We have to have a plan that addresses this from all aspects, not a plan that the former Speaker of the House described as a radical plan that was driven by right-wing social engineering. It is very ironic that on the very day we will be swearing in the next member of Congress from New York's 26th District, that we will be voting again on a budget that the people of that district, like people around the country, rejected because the former Speaker of the House had it right. It was radical and right-wing and not the right plan for America. Gentleman's recognized for an additional 15 seconds. I thank, I thank my, my colleague. And, you know, the, the question we're facing here is what, what is the best way forward? We all understand we have to have a budget deficit plan that's predictable and addresses that issue. But why in the world would we adopt a one-sided approach that has those priorities that says we're going to slash Medicare Gentleman's tax rates for the wealthy? Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to remind my colleagues from the other side of the aisle that the budget that they so referenced went through an open process. It was subject to debate. It was amended in this chamber and passed by this body. And if they're so disinclined to approve that budget or stand with that budget, I would ask them to reach out to their colleagues in the opposing chamber over in the Senate who have not passed a budget for the last 762 days and take the matter up with them. At that point in time, uh, at this point in time, Mr. Speaker, I'll yield five minutes to the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Ryan, Chairman of the Budget Committee. The gentleman I, from Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes. I thank the gentleman for, using, for yielding. I understand why this might be confusing to my friends on the other side of the aisle. After all, they didn't bother to pass a budget last year. Our friends on the other side of the rotunda in the Senate didn't pass, bother to pass a budget this year. We have a budget crisis. We've got a $1.5 trillion deficit. We've got a debt that is getting out of our control. And what do you do when you have a problem like that? You pass a budget. The reason we're doing what we are doing today is because our partners on the other side of the rotunda in the Senate didn't pass a budget. House Republicans did. We passed a budget. And we're acknowledging and living within that budget. If our friends on the other side of the aisle bothered to pass a budget, we wouldn't be in the situation where we are today. Now let's discuss about what our budget does and what it does not do. Number one, because we have a debt crisis, we think we have a moral obligation to our constituents, our children and our grandchildren, to put our budget on a path to balance and to pay off our national debt. We also think we need to put our economy on a path to prosperity so we can get job creation. Let's, for a moment, talk about Medicare. Medicare, as we know it, is already gone. Our friends on the other side of the aisle, when they passed the Affordable Care Act, they stopped the Medicare status quo. Under the President's new health care law, that ends Medicare as we know it. It does two things. It raids Medicare and it rations Medicare. It takes $500 billion from Medicare to spend on the President's new health care law. It doesn't take that money to extend its solvency. Just like people have complained for years, we're raiding the Social Security Trust Fund and we should stop doing that, the President's health care law does that to Medicare now. Second thing it does, starting next year, the President will appoint 15 unelectable, unaccountable bureaucrats 
to put in charge of Medicare, to price control and to ration Medicare for current seniors. What's worse is the President and the Senate still have yet to put out a plan to save Medicare to prevent it from going bankrupt. We stop the rate of Medicare in our budget and make sure that half a trillion dollars stays with Medicare to advance its solvency. I will not yield. Number two, we repeal the rationing board so that we don't put bureaucrats in charge of determining what kind of health care benefits seniors do or do not get. And number three, we save Medicare. And the way in which we do this is this. We say that if you're on Medicare, if you're 10 years away from retiring, 55 and above, government already made a promise to you. We want government to keep that promise. And so under our budget, we keep that promise. We stop the raid, we repeal the rationing board, and for those of us who are 54 and below, who have a bankrupt system that we right now cannot count on, we reform it so that it works like the system members of Congress and federal employees have. It's a system that looks like Medicare Advantage or the drug benefit works today, where seniors get a choice of plans offered to them by Medicare, guaranteed coverage options, from which they can choose, and Medicare subsidizes that plan. It doesn't subsidize people as much if they're wealthy, and it subsidizes them a lot more if they're low income, if they're sick. This saves Medicare. This puts Medicare on a path to solvency. And more importantly, by saving it for future generations, we can keep the promise to the current generation. We repeal the rationing board, we stop the raid, and we save the program. That's what our budget proposes to do. But with respect to this rule, we're talking about discretionary spending. We're talking about paying the bills this year for all those different government agencies. We simply think Congress should function the way the founders envisioned it, where we actually pass budgets, we actually scrutinize spending, and we actually finance government's functions and its agencies. We're not ducking our responsibility. We're passing our budgets. And because we're deeming those numbers in this year's bill, it is simply because of the fact that nobody else around here seems to be bothered with passing budgets. The President hasn't put out a plan to fix the problem, and the Senate has, has for a second year in a row, failed to even pass a budget. We're leading, we're saving Medicare, we're getting the debt under control, and we're working to create jobs in this economy, and we're governing by actually paying the bills and passing our appropriation bills. And with that, I yield. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you. I'd like to yield three minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Massachusetts is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman uh, very much. I rise in opposition to this Republican attempt to deem their budget passed. You know, just deem it passed so that we can begin with this process. Uh, it's just wrong. It's not the way we should be conducting business, but it's the way they have been operating all year. Now, recently, radio evangelist Harold Camping calculated that the world would end at precisely 6 p.m. on May 21st. Well, he was wrong. But much like Harold Camping's wildly inaccurate predictions, the House Republicans have come up with their own apocalyptic vision, the Republican rapture. It decides, this budget decides, who gets lifted up into the economic stratosphere and who gets left behind. Under this scheme, if you are a millionaire or a billionaire, you get raptured into heaven with all of your tax breaks remaining intact. But if your grandma and grandpa and your dependent upon Medicare in order to take care of your health care needs, you get moved to political purgatory. That's their plan. Now, if you're one of the big five oil companies that are reporting record profits, you get raptured with all of your tax breaks left intact. In this budget, which we are debating here today, you keep all of your tax breaks. But if you're a college kid 
hoping to get a Pell Grant. No, ladies and gentlemen, you are back in political purgatory. Your educational future is in question. Now, if you're an insurance company executive and you are now really rapturously happy because of the privatization of Medicare and the incredibly increased profits for the insurance industry, you're up here in heaven. You get raptured. This is the budget we're debating right now. Good news for all these wealthy people. But if you have Alzheimer's or cancer and you're hoping to find medical breakthroughs, they're cutting the NIH budget, the National Institutes of Hope budget, to find the cure for those diseases. Your hopes and dreams go to political purgatory. And if you have any hopes at all of having Medicare be saved, well, their budget guarantees that Medicare gets privatized, that Medicare is ended as we know it. And that Medicare budget is completely... Is com Gentlemen, is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. It's completely and totally smashed. So there's your debate here today, ladies and gentlemen. Are you with billionaires, big insurance, big oil? Are you with grandma and grandpa making sure that Medicare remains intact for the years ahead, honoring the promise that we made to them for giving us this great country that we live in today? That's the vote today. Vote yes or no on grandma. Vote no on that Republican budget and protect grandma's health care into the future. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to submit Section 501 of House Concurrent Resolution 34. For the record, as we seem to be commenting about it uh, at, uh, in a great uh, extent this, this afternoon, I just want the record to be clear that we submit Without the House objection. Resolution. Without objection. So ordered. Mr. Speaker, at this point in time, I yield four minutes to the gentleman from Florida, uh, Mr. Nugent. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for four minutes. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my friend, first of all, from uh, New York, Mr. Reed, and also a Rules Committee member that I serve with for the opportunity to support this rule and support the underlying legislation, H.R. 2017, which appropriates funds for our nation's homeland security operations for 2012. Just a comment. I thought that's what we were here to talk about. And so we're going to go back on track in regards to where we should be. As a member of the Rules Committee, I'm proud of this rule. It is the first open rule in four years, Mr. Speaker, and that's because of you. It's a continuation of our promise to the American people that we're committed to bringing openness and free-flowing debate to this chamber as a service to the American public. It's just like the rules that keep our promises to the American people, so does the underlying legislation. It keeps our promise to reduce spending, to narrow the size and scope of the federal government. It also keeps our promise to provide those men and women who work day in and day out to keep our nation safe with the tools and the resources they need. I've heard a lot about local first responders in connection with this bill. Mr. Speaker, I spent my entire career in law enforcement. I spent the last 40 years as a cop. In the last 10 of those years, I served as a sheriff of a county in Florida. You don't need to tell me about what our local first responders need. I know it firsthand. I've lived it. And I can tell you this. We need to follow the local example that those folks in Florida and across this nation and states have shown us. Our local police and firefighters know how to do more with less. It's one thing the federal government has never quite grasped. Would you like to have more money? Sure we would. But they understand our nation's in dire fiscal situation and they want more than anything else is for America to be here for their future and their children and grandchildren's future. When I was sheriff, I was faced with budget shortages, and I made tough cuts. I eliminated programs that I'm sure that I would love to have kept in place, but they didn't meet the core mission that I was elected to do. That's how local government works, Mr. Speaker. And Washington needs to learn from local governments 
in regards to how to get their act together as it relates to spending. Mr. Speaker, H.R. 2017 is a good bill, and I applaud the Appropriations Committee for their commitment to our homeland security. I encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support this legislation and support the open rule. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the balance of his time. The gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Mississippi, the ranking member on Homeland Security, Mr. Thompson. The gentleman from Mississippi is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in opposition to the rule for H.R. 2017, the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Act of 2012. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attack. As Americans began to process the carnage inflicted by Osama bin Laden on our soil, then President Bush challenged us as a nation to confront every threat from any source that could bring sudden terror and suffering to America. For nearly 10 years, we've done just that. We've made major investments in intelligence, border security, transportation security, and emergency preparedness. H.R. 2017 suddenly veers away from these incremental efforts and, as a result, set our nation on a dangerously wrong path. To cut Homeland Security preparedness grants by $2.1 billion at a time when DHS is calling for a period of heightened alert because of our successful action against bin Laden is deplorable and reckless. How can we continue these efforts with an appropriation bill that funds DHS at 7 percent below what President Obama tells us that DHS needs and is beyond? The probability of a terrorist attack on a major domestic transit system has not subsided, nor has Mother Nature relented and softened the barrage of punishing blows to our communities, including such as my own congressional district. This bill sacrifices the security of our communities just to save a penny here and a penny there. Our first responders must not be treated as pawns to the political ideology of the day. It is the decimation of the first responder grant programs at the hands of the Republican leadership that by far is the most offensive aspect of this bill. The second most offensive aspect of this bill is the shenanigans surrounding... Yeah, additional 30 seconds, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. Thank you very much. The second most offensive aspect of this bill is the shenanigans surrounding the funding of disasters emergencies. Lastly, Ending Medicare in this rule makes absolutely no sense. For these reasons, I oppose H.R. 2017 and ask my colleagues to join me in voting against the rule and the underlying bill. I yield back. The gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a member of the Rules Committee and the Budget Committee, uh, I'm excited to be down here today. Uh, you told us, Mr. Speaker, when this Congress began that we were going to witness one of the most open Congresses uh, in this country's history. And you have delivered on that uh, each and every day. And I'm one of the new guys uh, in Congress. I've only been here about 125 uh, days. But what I saw, we're talking about budgets here today, what I saw in the budget process was a leadership team and the chair of the Rules Committee who said, bring me a budget any budget, I don't care who you are, whether you're the most senior member of this body or the most junior member of this body, bring me a budget and we will consider it on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. Come on. Come all. Give us your ideas and we'll consider them. Well, we had that process. I voted for two budgets on, uh, uh, on that budget uh, voting uh, day. I voted for the Republican Study Committee budget, which I thought was a great uh, a budget, and I voted for uh, the Budget Committee's budget. I sit on the Budget Committee, Paul Ryan, and the Budget Committee put in a tremendous amount of work, and that was the budget that ended up carrying the day. And so that's the budget we're operating under right here today. Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, first bill out of the chute. And what would you do, Mr. Speaker? You said, come one, Come all, if you have an idea about how to improve this appropriations bill, bring it to the floor of the House and we'll consider it. Bring it to the floor of the House and we'll consider it. Now, you might think, if you don't know as much about uh, uh, this House, if you're a newcomer like me, you might think it goes on that way all the time, but it doesn't. 
because it's hard. It's hard. I can only imagine, Mr. Speaker, what you get from folks back home because they probably say to you, close down the process, push a conservative agenda, do it your way, make people fall in line. And you said no. You said the House works best when the House works its will. You said any member of the House that can find 218 members to agree with them can work their will on the floor. And that's the process that we're opening up. Not a Republican process, not a Democratic process, but an American process where the power of the ideas are what rules the day. And that's taken a huge commitment from the Speaker and a huge commitment from the Rules Committee Chairman uh, to make this process happen, a huge commitment uh, from the Appropriations Chairman to make this happen. But I'll tell you, uh, for anybody out there who's thinking in partisan terms, it takes a commitment from both sides of the aisle. Open rules break down. Uh, when we can't make those open rules work together. I see my friend Mr. Polis uh, from the Rules Committee, strong advocate of the open rules process, and here we are for the first time uh, since July of 2007. And we're going to find out if we can make this work uh, together. New crowd uh, on your side of the aisle, new crowd on my side of the aisle. We're going to find out if we can make it work together. Golly, I hope we can. I hope we can because it's the right thing to do. Because I only have a voice in this body when I can bring my amendments to the floor, I only have a voice in this body when I can represent the 921,000 people back home. And, Mr. Speaker, you have given that to us over and over again. And I Gentleman's think. time has expired. Gentleman from Colorado. The, uh, the Democrats have no problem with the open rule. What the Democrats have a problem with is the elimination of Medicare, which is deemed and passed in the language of the rule itself and cannot be amended after the passage of the rule. It's my honor to yield one, mo one minute to the gentlewoman from California, the Democratic leader, Ms. Pelosi. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition uh, to the rule that is on the floor today uh, because th voting for this rule is a vote to abolish Medicare. Here we are uh, once again after the public has spoken so clearly on the subject of wanting to have Medicare as a pillar of health and economic security for our seniors. The Republicans saying we're going to double down. Not only did we vote to abolish Medicare, increasing costs for seniors, lowering benefits, and get, while giving tax breaks to oil companies and corporations for shipping jobs overseas. Not only have we done that once, but we're going to do it again today. On a day that we're going to swear in a new member of Congress, a reminder that all of us takes an oath of office to protect and defend. And this bill, the bill that this rule comes up on Homeland Security, undermines the ability to protect and defend the American people. So this is a double whammy. It's a threat, again, to the health and economic security of our seniors and those who depend on Medicare, and it is a threat to the safety of the American people. I heard, I heard my colleague, uh, Mr. Markey, talk about purgatory and and rapture and the rest and his uh, original and effective presentation. And it reminded me what we always say when we talk about a budget, that it should be a statement of our values. What is important to us should be reflected there. Our budget proposals, we had one under the leadership of Chris Van Hollen that was heard uh, and voted on by the floor a number of weeks ago, Republican budget that is on the floor today in the form of this rule are windows to the soul of who we are as public officials. And this rule today, which deems passage of the Republican budget, is a window to the soul of the Republican Party in this House of Representatives. That it would put, it would put oil companies giving big tax subsidies to big oil, would put corporations that ship jobs overseas, we give tax cuts to the wealthiest people in our country while it says to seniors, no more Medicare for you. You're going to pay more, get less, and weaken the middle class at the same time. Weakening the middle class because of abolishing Medicare and weakening the middle class because of what it does to education for our young children and making college more expensive for nearly 10 million young people in our country. Is that an investment in the future? I don't think so. 
But it's really important when we talk about our soul and our values and our, what our priorities and our, what our priorities that we note that a vote for this bill is a really a serious assault on the middle class. People are concerned about the, the uh, dignity of our, uh, in retirement of our seniors. They're concerned about the education of our children. They want to reduce the deficit. We must create jobs. Growth in our economy will help reduce the deficit. This bill does none of the above. So again, it's about what we believe in. And Mr. Speaker, I have to give you credit for this. The Republicans are true to what they believe in. They do not believe in Medicare, and they are voting today to honor their beliefs to abolish Medicare. That has been a consistent message over time. It is reinforced here today. I urge my colleagues to vote no on the rule and no on the uh, uh, underlying bill. With that, I yield back the balance of my time.